So everybody wonders why I have this year-end report up here, and it's because it, it turns out that this time of year is when uh, my NIH grant report is due to Dr. Whittemore. And since she's here, it's so wonderful to be able to present it in person instead of having to actually make a poor report and write it. Going home now, you're all right. You can tell us what you really did. Okay. <laughs> this is uh, the exercise model that we've used for 10 years now. Um, we do an extensive uh, set of questionnaires, uh, about 50 actually. Um, we let you guys do them online using a Google Forms system. So you can stop whenever you want. As a result, it's not exhausting. Um, amongst those, you'll see the results of a questionnaire on depression uh, that I'll show next. As part of the history and physical, uh, it's gotten to the point where now it's 50 pages long. Uh, fill in the blanks. For me, uh, it can take up to four days to complete. It's not the sort of thing that your GP is going to do in eight minutes. But I'm trying to work with the common data elements that, that have been discussed to try to develop the key questions that should be asked that it should be asked in every study so that we can standardize our patient populations from around the world. Same thing goes to the questionnaires as well. After we have, oh, sorry, Maddie. So we also do allergy skin tests in everybody. And the rates of skin test positivity are equivalent between ME-CFS and our control population. This is now our fourth cohort where we've done that. The levels of the antibody of allergy, IgE, are also equivalent between the two groups. So I don't believe there's an increase in true allergic disease. What there is is an increase in sensitivity. And I'll show you that uh, in the second bullet point. Okay, so after I get done talking to them, we do an extensive MRI. Uh, this includes an MRI during a cognitive test, so we can see if there are differences in regions of the brain that are activated while you're doing a memory task. Then we do exercise. Uh, this is very similar to the, to the plan that uh, Maureen ha Will Hansen and her group will use, except that I do a sub-maximal test. It's uh, different. Hers is a maximal 8 to 12 minute task, but we do 10 mi uh, 30 minutes at 70% of a person's predicted heart rate. And then if they can increase, they'll go up to 85%, which is the same as a cardiac stress test. I'm, you don't have to do 30 minutes. If you want to stop, you stop. That essentially would be your maximum. Um, I'm not there with a cattle prod, you know, electrocuting <laughs> people to keep going. And in fact, we find that between day one and day two, we have highly reproducible Tests. I'll show you that data. After the second day exercise, we do our second MRI because we want to see are there areas of the brain that are changed while you're thinking, doing a problem, and are those changes caused by exercise? Is this a model for exertional exhaustion? Finally, everybody who wants to gets a lumbar puncture. So come on down. <laughs> I keep people in overnight because we've got a protocol to reduce the risk of spinal headaches. Uh, so what we're going to talk about is depression. You all are depressed, right? Uh, we'll talk about pain and tenderness, uh, the exercise, um, 
the postural tachycardia that is not the same as POTS, orthostatic intolerance, our MRIs, and then some of the results from our cerebral spinal fluid. Okay. So the Center for Epidemiological Studies Depression Questionnaire is, is sort of a gold standard for assessing the risk of depression within populations. So this is like the risk in the United States, in Nigeria, in all HIV, in all diabetics. Um, it is a, a study, it's a 20 question um, scale, zero to three. Uh, the sum is of, a score of the test is 60, and it's been found that if you have a score of 16 or more, you are depressed. Remember that 16. That's been shown in uh, a series, uh, 28 studies involving over 22,000 people. Unfortunately, it's got a 30% false positive rate. <laughs> I wonder why. We'll take a look at that in a second. Um, with this test, you can also do a mathematical analysis called factor analysis. And it breaks down into four factors that are uh, grouped together from these 20 items. Somatic, depressed, anhedonia, lack of pleasure, and interpersonal. And the somatic factors are fatigue, sleep, cognition, effort, bother, you talk less, and appetite change. Does that sound familiar? Sorry? Okay. Thank you. These four factors have been known for decades, but nobody's ever bothered to score them in any patient population group. So we decided we'd do it. Uh, one of the reasons that fatigue is associated with depression, uh, well, actually, we don't know why, but uh, das, uh, Ross Fuhrer and this guy Wesley found there was a strong relationship between symptoms of depression measured by this scale and fatigue. Fatigue was neither sensitive nor specific for depression. We were talking about getting a knighthood for somebody earlier. We'll have to talk about that. Okay. Um, I'm going to try to make this graph a little bit easier for you. This is, uh, well, across the bottom, this is 100%. For each of these domains, or the total score, this would be the maximum. Down here, it would be zero. For the black line, which is the total score out of 60, this is that line of 16 out of 60 that determines if you're at risk for depression. Make sense? So I'm looking at the black line here, and in this group of, that's representative of the US population, you can see that uh, about 24% here, that's 75% minus 100, 24% uh, are at risk for depression. Is that clear? Okay, so the next thing is to look at the red line, which is the somatic scores, the anhedonia line, which is green, and the actual depressed questions, like I'm blue, I'm sad. And you'll notice that anhedonia really is, is quite a problem in just about every uh, American population we've looked at. What happens in depression? Um, this is unpublished data. Despite there being uh, several, hundred, uh, several hundred studies, they don't report the raw data. We used all that is available on the internet and in the, in the press uh, literature. We came up with 269 cases of depression that had the SSD actual scores. These are the people 
that um, formed the basis of the Promise questionnaires. And you can see, looking at their scores, their curves all look just about the same. And down here, the black line crosses and says that 94% of the depressed population will have a score of more than greater than 16 out of 60. So here's our healthies, here's our depressed, vast difference between the two. What happens in chronic fatigue syndrome? That's right here. Here's our control, our total score, and it crosses at 54%. So 54% of you are at risk for depression. Did you know that? You thought it was more, right? Okay, so you're at risk for depression. Here is the, your somatic scores. And if you'll notice, they're the same as this depressed group. This is anhedonia, lack of pleasure enjoyment. And here are the actual items for depression. I'm sad, I'm blue, etc. So only about 30% have any signi or, uh, have significant um, levels of depressed uh, responses to these depression questions. Here's the total, the sum of these three. And from this, I would conclude that this 54% is actually biased by the high somatic scores. And if you re recall that it's cognition, fatigue, sleep, etc., things that are in the diagnostic criteria for CFS that are driving this score, you can see that this is totally biased when it comes to concluding that you guys are depressed. This is more telling. I've been impressed at how optimistic and non-depressed uh, our CFS population is. This is the same thing for Gulf War illness. Okay, so I put a red line through depression because I don't think it contributes. What about tenderness? So is anybody tender out there? Okay, does anybody have pain? Okay, so pain is not in the systemic exertion intolerance disease criteria because it doesn't differentiate CFS from other diseases like fibromyalgia. I've got a big problem about how we define these conditions. So instead of, uh, to try to bypass that, I wanted to know about tenderness, which means I take my thumb and I press on you with four kilograms of pressure and does it hurt? And I don't like that because everybody's four kilograms of pressure is different, so we use a spring-loaded gauge, pressing slowly with the patient in charge to tell us to stop when it hurts. And when we do that, pressing at the 18 traditional fibromyalgia sites, we can then average the pressures and come up with a, a kilogram amount of pressure required to cause significant pain. And that's what we're looking at here. In black are the control population. You can see that their average is about seven kilograms. So for the usual person off the street, it would take seven kilograms of pressure to cause pain. Uh, here in green, you can see our chronic fatigue syndrome group. It's a little bit wide across here, but the peak is below four, is at four kilograms. So it's significantly shifted to the left from the controls. Um, here's what I call a fibromyalgia group, but let's not go into how I defined them. Otherwise, Brian Wallet will get very, very mad at me. Uh, I, I was Brian Wallet's mentor. Did you know that? Uh, goes to show. Brian's, by the way, Brian's doing a fantastic job with running this NIH 
CFS study. Um, I know he's gotten some bad press, but he really has put together a fantastic study. And I'm very excited we're going to get real data out of it. Anyways, back to this. Here's the controls. Here's chronic fatigue. Here's Gulf War. This is all females. Here's our receiver operator curve, which I'm not going to believe any data unless I see it, a receiver operator curve. It shows that up here where our red line crosses this diagonal, 80% of the true positive Gulf War women will have tenderness and 80% of the control women will be negative. So that's a very good curve. For CFS, not as good. It's about 65%. So it's not diagnostic, but this shift is still significant. And what it says to me is that it takes less of a trigger, less pressure to cause symptoms. That means that that pressure is coming up from your periphery to your, the back of your spinal cord. It's hitting a, a place where you regulate that, that sensation. In most people, it takes seven kilograms of pressure for a pain message to get through. But in chronic fatigue syndrome, that bar is broken. The threshold is lower. It only takes three or four kilograms for that pressure message to come through. Is that clear? I think the same thing occurs when you breathe formaldehyde or outgassed uh, from uh, paint or other perfumes or bright lights, loud sounds. The threshold is broken so that what would be background ambient noise can become tragically uh, upsetting, loud, and overblown when you have chronic fatigue syndrome. It's a, not imaginary. It's a very real broken switch, broken control process. It's a hypothesis. Okay. So, CFS has tenderness. What about the maximum, submaximal exercise? Uh, when we did this, we thought we would see the same type of decrease in the VO2 as uh, in the maximum uh, exercise stress test. This is a group of healthy controls, men and women. And there's four lines here. Day one, exercise, day two, exercise, men and women. And the four lines are superimposed when you correct for body mass. So in the controls, there was uh, no change in their uh, oxygen consumption on the second day compared to the first one. Here's our CFS group, females, males, day one, day two. I don't have to tell you which lines which because they overlap. Unlike what's reported with the maximal test, we cannot see a difference at day two. And it turns out that our two days of exercise are virtually identical. Again, I mentioned that it's not maximal. You don't have to finish the entire uh, 25 minutes. We have people that last two minutes. If they do it on the first day, they last two minutes the next day. If it's 15, it's 15 and 15. So it's highly reproducible, which turns out to be useful as far as our MRIs are concerned. It also means that if there is a decrease in VO2 in the maximum test, there's something magical happening after our people stop. I don't know what it is. Again, we need to know how many people in the maximal test actually do have a decrease. How much of a decrease? We need to know the sensitivity specificity 
particularly if we're going to use this as a diagnostic for CFS, and certainly if we're going to use it for disability testing. Okay. So how many folks here have POTS? Okay, just one. Good. Two. Okay. Do I hear three? No. Okay. So a, a few years ago, uh, we were exercising Gulf War illness in exactly the same protocol. And uh, Rakib Rehan, who presented this work here, uh, found a very unusual group of patients. He found that uh, one-third of the people who had their first exercise test developed postural tachycardia. So lying down, they would have their normal heart rate. And before exercise, they would stand up and they would have a change of about 12 in their heart rate. That's delta HR that I'll use. But after exercise, this one-third of the people would stand up and they'd have an increase of at least 30 beats, which is the definition that you use for POTS. So th this was quite surprising to us. I didn't believe it. We got funded and did a, a verification study and have now confirmed it in Gulf War illness. And because it's a verification study, the paper reviewers say it's really interesting, they're very excited, but no, they're rejecting the paper. <laughs> so that's what happens with verification studies. I beg your pardon. Thank you, sir. Got it. Don't publish anything. Okay. <laughs> well, no, it's good science. And it needs to be out, you need to have things out there. Okay, so here's the, the original data from the Gulf War. If you look at the, look here, you see the before exercise, the uh, three groups, the controls, start and stop group, have a change in heart rate of about 10 to 12. The yellow and the green are the controls in our majority of Gulf War people, and they have no change. But you see our stress test activated reversible tachycardia or start group actually have an increase of their heart rate in that first time window after their exercise stress test. And in this group it maintained uh, to be significantly higher throughout. This was cute, but it didn't, it, it, we didn't think it was real. But then we found that the same group had, had brainstem atrophy. This is like Quiatech reported in chronic fatigue syndrome. And we found a difference in the regions that were activated in the brain during the cognitive test. So we had to do, extend this into chronic fatigue. And we did find that we had a start group in our chronic fatigue group uh, subjects. We also, as expected, found a POTS group over on the far side. Most of the people did not have cardiac abnormalities when they stood up. So here, before exercise, uh, you can see that the range was 0 to 20 for the change in heart rate standing up. Then after the black line, red arrow, post-exercise, it didn't in, it didn't change, didn't go up. In the POTS group, you can see that before exercise, all of the points were higher. All of the people had, um, within a five minute period, they had at least two time points where the change was 30 in beats or more. So they had POTS every time we measured their heart rate change. And then after exercise, there is a potential that there was a slight increase in their uh, difference. The curious thing that we didn't expect is our st uh, to find a start group in CFS. Their heart rates are about the same as the controls, less than the POTS people. 
and then afterwards they have at least two time points within each of those circles where they do reach a higher level. I can only hope that everybody who's doing exercise uh, stress tests will try to do this uh, lying and standing uh, test before and after so they can disprove what we've found here. Otherwise, we'll have a big problem trying to explain it. So which of these groups has orthostatic, tech, or orthostatic intolerance? No idea? Is it door number one? Door number two? Or door number three? Vanna? All of them. All of them, okay. Is that what you guys say? Okay. So here's a dizziness score. So we take scores before uh, lying down and once they've stood up for five minutes and uh, here's the scores lying down. In uh, the start group, the, I'm sorry, in the group that had no changes, you see that we have some people that have dizziness at a score of 10 out of 20. It's the same all the way across, regardless uh, uh, before or after exercise. There are a lot of people who are all zeros as well. In our start group, the same thing. We've got a major. Um, We've got people, a majority, that have some positive score lying down. And same thing with the POTS people. Next, we stand them up. And you can see that in our people who had no heart rate change, therefore no autonomic dysfunction, they have higher dizziness scores, so orthostatic changes. Same thing in our start group, same thing in our POTS group. And this is the net change. And we've done, had to do a whole bunch of statistics to come up with anything that says we have a statistically significant signal of orthostatic intolerance. Uh, that's being actively worked on while I'm away, I hope. <laughs> Cats away, mice will play. Okay. It, what, what, what it does do, though, is makes me wonder, what is orthostatic intolerance? Is it, again, a difference in this sensitivity coming from your vestibular system, that you are feeling dizzy and lightheaded even though you're lying down. And it has nothing to do with what your heart rate or autonomic system is doing. Okay, the MRI data is a mess because it's only a couple of days old. So I'm just going to go through this very, fairly quickly. Um, those fuzzy diagrams, they're not gonna make any sense to you. The key thing to look at is how many lines here are in bold and italics. Because that'll be regions of the brain that are active on day one and over here, day two after exercise. This is the control group. And the important message is, yeah, there's some changes, but it's not that big. We're going to have to analyze those a lot more to see what their significance is. The top is the control group again. Down at the bottom is the group that had no change in their heart rate. And what's very clear is you don't see any bold italics areas here. They're the same both days. No change with exercise. The only thing that changed was the brain stem was activated. And when I get back, we'll have to see what area that is. The top is actually the start people that have the post-exercise tachycardia. Um, I've got a typo there that says stop. I forgot to catch it. The picture is more faint because there are fewer subjects. So only pay attention to what's in bold and italics 
and you'll see that in our start people, they've got lots of areas that, are, that light up that the next day they don't. Something different is happening. They have fewer areas that light up. This is the same as what we saw in Gulf War illness, although I can't tell you if it's exactly the same regions. Um, when it comes to the POTS group, I wanted to see what they did. It's very, it's right, uh, it's really too small to do any statistics, but what was very curious is that you can see they don't light up anything on this side where the purple arrow is on day one, but they light it up on day two. So the POTS people recruited an area up here that's critical for memory function and task operation. Why the POTS people would do that is I have no clue. And when I get back, we've got a lot of statistics to do to figure out what's going on here. But I think we can conclude that at least in those two that do have changes in heart rate, we get bad brain function after the exercise. The start group, I think, will be important because it may indicate that if you do not have POTS, if you have a normal heart rate change standing up, you may do more exertion and then develop a transient POTS-like state, this start condition. And if that happens, that may be enough to cause you to have some alterations. We'll see. And finally, we've been looking at uh, cerebral spinal fluid with our lumbar punctures. This is just one of the modalities. Uh, MIRNA, microRNA is hot this year. It's actually very good. And what we found in chronic fatigue, if you allow my abbreviations, is that the levels were higher in people who did not do exercise and the MIRNA levels went down after exercise. It's not a robust enough marker to be considered diagnostic for CFS, but it has led to some interesting ideas about what may be going wrong. After exercise, the, the miRNA will go down its job is to bind to messenger RNA and have that messenger RNA get destroyed. So if the microRNA level goes down, you have more messenger RNA, you can make more protein, and that protein will have more function. And at this point, it looks like the effects of exercise in CFS are to increase these particular enzymes. Of importance, insulin-like growth factor one receptor, transforming growth factor beta receptor one are very important for proliferation of brain cells. We've also looked at where these are found and they're in microglia and the choroid plexus, which is a uh, vascular region where most of the cerebral spinal fluid is created. That gives us some hints as to where we may find dysfunction that is uh, mediating any alterations that we do find after exercise. Okay. So we've uh, scratched the surface of our data, and we've uh, shown that you guys don't have depression. You've got somatic problems. There's the increase of tenderness and increased allowing signals to come through. You've got the cardiac effects, MRI effects, and cerebral spinal fluid changes. 
And with that, I'd like to thank you for allowing me to give my report. I hope it's a good report for you. I hope it was clear. If not, come up and ask questions afterwards. And thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Jim, for that thorough report. Um, yes, it's not bad. Um, would anyone like to ask some questions or make some comments? Yes, here in the middle. for a daughter who's been ill for about 28 years or so, since she was a child. Um, what strikes me about this is the fact that people are doing an exercise one day and you are then making measurements the next day. I find that if she does something excessive, I go to see the cardiologist one day, the next day we think, oh, that wasn't too bad, we can manage that, maybe you can see a friend. But the day after that, it really kicks in and there's extreme pain, uh, vision goes, her hearing goes, she, that's when you get all the symptoms, not the day after. So I'm kind of not surprised that if you do the measurements the day after, there may not be a lot of difference. I th one of the uh, things we're looking at is what is that time period, that delay, how much exertion is required to produce a delay in the response, and st a curious thing is that sometimes a smaller response will lead to an immediate collapse and the bigger effect may have a de longer delay. That's just a, a few anecdotes. We have to go and do the numbers. But what is post-exertional malaise? That's what we hope to come up with as we work on these numbers. Okay. Last question. One other. I have a patient who had bad POTS and he went to get this formally recognized with tilt table testing and uh, he somehow or other managed to persuade the, the doctors who did the tilt table testing to put a HICWA line in and um, his routine now is to start every morning with a litre of normal saline through his HICWA line and uh, that uh, fixes his pots and makes him feel much better. I don't know whether anyone else has the same experience, but a, a Hickman line just for that purpose seems to be quite a drastic measure. Uh, it is, but I've had one patient who had a central line put in. She would infuse two liters and then go do her shopping or other business, come back, do two liters, go to sleep, and she felt like she was on top of the world because she could accomplish things. I've had other patients, we give them their infusion after their LP, they all of a sudden brighten up. I don't know why. Um, we've heard about it in the literature actually, um, but we can't get the insurance companies to pay for an infu a daily infusion, for example, like your patient. It's very curious. I, I was so impressed with the effects of the, you know, of the normal saline intravenously uh, uh, every morning, and a liter, you know, quite quickly over about half an hour, uh, it seems to make him feel much better. And it's, you know, it may well be something we need to to consider for for the routine routine treatment. So we use vitamin G in our patients. I know. Uh, Theo had some recommendations, but ours was vitamin G, which is Gatorade, and have had very good responses. Thank you very much for Thank your you, Jim, attention. Thank you, Jim, very much indeed.